Well, I know it's been some small delay, but we have now returned to tell another story. I hope things continue to go apace and the world continues to treat you well because it is very troubled right now. But today my story is a story called The Snake Prince. I believe it is from India. It's a very old, old story. <clears throat> but shall we begin? Once upon a time, there lived by herself, in a city, an old woman who was desperately poor. One day, she found that she had only a handful of flour left in the kitchen, and to nobody at all to buy any more flour, or any hope of earning it. Carrying her little brass pot, very sadly she made her way down to the water to bathe, and to obtain some water, thinking afterwards to come home and make herself an unleavened cake of what flour she had left, and after that she did not know what was to become of her. While she was bathing, she left her little breast pot upon the river bank, covered with a cloth, to keep it the inside nice and clean. But when she came up out of the river, she took the cloth off to fill the pot with water, and she saw inside it the glittering folds of a deadly snake. At once she popped the cloth again into the mouth of the pot and held it there. And then she said to herself, Ah, a kind death. I will take you home with me to my house, and there I will shake you out of my pot, and you will bite me, and I will die, and all my troubles will be ended. With these sad thoughts in her mind, the poor old woman hurried home, holding her cloth carefully in the mouth of the pot. And when she got home, she set all the doors and all the windows, and took away the cloth, and turned the pot upside down upon her hearthstone. <coughs> What was her surprise to find that instead of a deadly snake, which she expected to fall out of the pot, there fell out with a, uh, a rattle and a clang the most magnificent set of flashing jewels. Because that makes sense, you know. Necklace, jewels, snake, pot. Maybe too much pot? I don't know. For a few minutes, she could hardly think or speak, but stood there staring. And then with trembling hands, she picked the necklace up, folded it in the center of her veil, and hurried off to the king's hall of public audience. A petition, O king, she said, a petition for thy private ears alone. And when her prayer had been granted, she found herself alone with the king. She shook out her veil at his feet, and there from it fell in its glittering coils the splendid necklace. As soon as the king saw it, he was filled with amazement and delight. The more he looked, the more he felt he must possess it. So he gave the old woman 500 silver pieces for it and put it straight away into his pocket. Away she went, filled with happiness, for the money that the king had given her was enough to keep her the rest of her life because, you know, money solves every single problem. Now, as soon as he could leave his business, the king then hurried off and showed his wife his prize, with which she was as pleased as he was, if not more so. And as soon as they had finished admiring that necklace, they locked it up in the great chest where the queen's jewelry was kept, the key of which always hung around the king's neck, because, you know, some reason a wife would let her husband hold the key to all her jewelry. I don't know. I don't get that. But a short while afterwards, the neighboring king sent a message that to say that a most lovely girl baby had been born to him, and then he invited his neighbors to come to a great feast in honor of that occasion. The queen told her husband that, of course, she must be present at that banquet and she wished to wear her new necklace, which he had given to her. They had only a short time to prepare for the journey, and at, last, at the last moment the king went to the jewel chest to take out the necklace for his wife to wear, but he could see only no necklace at all, but a fat little boy crowing and shouting in a jewelry box. Okay. Uh, he called for his wife so loudly she came running, thinking the necklace must have been stolen. Look here, look here, cried the king. Haven't always we longed for a son, and now heaven has sent us one. Well, you should be careful what you pray for. What do you mean, cried the, cried the queen. Are you mad? I should hope not, dancing in excitement around the open chest. Come and look. Look at what we have instead of that necklace. Just then the baby let out a great crow of joy, as though he would like to jump up and dance with the king. And the queen gave a cry of surprise, because, you know, she didn't have, a, had, had, blah, blah. there was no kid. She'd had no kid, but there was a kid here. Oh, she grasped. She looked at that baby. What a darling! Where could he have come from? 
I am sure that I cannot say. All I know is that we locked up the necklace in the chest, and when I unlocked it just now, there was no necklace, but there was a baby, and the finest babies there ever had been seen. By this time, the queen had the baby in her arms, because of course she did. Oh, look, she cried, fairer ornament for the bosom of a queen than any necklace could ever um, been wrought. Right, she continued, right to our neighbor, and say that we cannot come to his feast, for we must have a feast of our own and a baby of our own. Oh, happy day. So the visit was given up in honor of the new baby. The bells of the city and its guns and its trumpets and its people and its uh, clappers and drums and everything all big and small that could make any kind of noise at all had hardly any rest for a week. There was such a ringing, banging, blaring, crashing sound of celebration and fireworks and feasting and rejoicing and merrymaking as had never been seen at all before. I'm sure it was great for the kingdom's budget. A few years had passed. And the king's boy baby and his neighbor's girl baby grew and thrived and grew some more. And the two kings arranged that as soon as they were old enough, they should marry. And so, with much signing of papers and agreements and wagging of wise heads and stroking of ray beards, the compact was made and signed and sealed and lay waiting for its fulfillment. Because arranging other people's lives is, you know, totally a thing you should do. Not really. This, too, came to pass. <clears throat> For as soon as the prince and the princess were of the proper age, the kings agreed that it was time for the wedding, and the young prince journeyed away to the neighboring kingdom to meet his bride, and was there married to her with great and renewed rejoicings. Now, I must tell you that we returned to the old woman who had sold the king the necklace, and had been called in by him now to be, a year to the, uh, to be nurse to the young prince. And she loved her charge so dearly, and was, much, was a most faithful servant. She could not help talking just a little, and so by and by it began to be rumored that there was some magic about the young prince's being born. And the rumor, of course, had come in due time to the ears of the parents of that princess. So now she was going to be the wife of the prince, and her mother, who was as curious as many other people are, said to her daughter on the eve of the journey, Remember, the first thing you have to do is find out what this story is about the prince, and in order to do that, you must not speak a word to him about wherever, uh, whatever he says until he asks you why you are quiet. And then you must ask him what the truth is about his magic birth. And until he tells you, you must not speak to him again, because manipulation is clearly the way we get things done, and honesty is not at all it. The princess promised that she would follow her mother's advice. <clears throat> Therefore, when they were married, and the prince spoke to his bride, she did not answer him. He could not think what was the matter. But even about her old home, she would not utter a word. At last, he asked why she would not speak. And then she said, you must tell me the secret of your birth. The prince became very sad and displeased. Although she pressed him sorely, he would not tell her an only uh, reply. If I tell you, you will regret that you ever asked me. For several months, they lived together, and it was not such a happy time for them as it ought to have been. For the secret was still a secret, and lay between them like a cloud between the sun and the earth, making what should be fair, dull, and sad. At length the prince could bear it no longer, so he said to his wife, At midnight I will tell you my secret, if you still wish it, but you will regret it all your life. However, the princess was so overjoyed that she had succeeded and paid no attention to his warning. That night the prince ordered horses to be ready, the princess and himself, and a little before midnight he placed her upon one and mounted the other. They rode together down to the river to the place where the old woman had very first found a snake in her brass pot. There the prince drew a rein, drew rein in his horse and said, Do you still insist that I should tell you my secret? And the princess answered, Yes, if I do, said the prince, remember, you will regret it all your life. But the princess only replied, Tell me, tell me. Then, said the prince, know that I am the son of the king of a far country, but by enchantment I was turned into a snake. The word snake had hardly escaped his lips when he disappeared. And the princess heard a rustle and saw a ripple in the water, and in the faint moonlight she beheld a snake swimming into the river. Soon it vanished, and she was left alone. In vain she waited with a beating heart for something to happen for the prince to come back, but nothing happened, and no one came back. Only the wind mourned through the trees on the river bank, and the night birds cried, and a jackal howled off in the distance, and the river flowed black and silent past her. 
and that is why you should be careful what you wish for. In the morning, they found her weeping and disheveled on the riverbank, but no word could they learn from her or from anyone as to the fate of her husband. At her wish, they built on the riverbank a little house of black stone, and there she lived in mourning, with a very few servants and guards to watch over her. A long, long time passed, and still the princess lived in mourning for her prince, and saw no one, and went nowhere away from her house on the river bank, and the garden that surrounded it. One morning she woke, and she found a stain of fresh mud upon the carpet. She sent for the guards, who had watched outside the house day and night, and asked them who could have entered while she slept. They declared nothing and no one could have entered that house, for they kept such careful watch that not even a bird could fly in without their knowledge, and none of them could explain that stain of mud. The next day, again the princess found the stain of mud, and she questioned everyone most carefully, but none could say how it came to be there. On the third day, on the third night, rather, the princess determined to lie awake herself and watch, for fear she might fall asleep. She cut her finger with a pen knife and rubbed salt into that cut that the pain of it might keep her from sleeping, because, yeah, ouch. And so she lay awake with her smarting finger that really, really hurt, and at midnight she saw a snake come wiggling along the ground with some mud from the river in its mouth. And when it came near her bed, it reared up its head and dropped its muddy head on the bedclothes. She was very frightened, but she tried to control her fear, and she called out, Who are you, and what do you do here? Because talking to snakes makes sense. But, in this case, it did. Because the snake answered, I am the prince, your husband. And I am come back to visit you. And then the princess began to weep. And the snake continued, Alas, I did not say, did I not say, that if I told you my secret, you would regret it? And have you not regretted it? Oh, indeed, cried the princess. I have regretted it, and I shall regret it all my life. Is there nothing I can do? And the snake answered, There is one thing, if you dare it. Only tell me, said the princess, I will do anything. Then replied the snake, On a certain night you must put a large bowl of milk and sugar in front of each of the four corners of this room. All the snakes in the river will come out and drink that milk, and the one that leads the way will be the queen of the snakes. You must stand in her way at the door and say, O oh, queen of snakes, queen of snakes, give to me back my husband. And perhaps she will do it. But if you are frightened and do not stop her, you will never see me again. With that, he glided away. On the night of which the snake told her, Princess got four large bowls of milk and sugar, and put one in each corner of the room, and stood in the doorway waiting. At midnight, there was a great hissing and rustling from the direction of the river, and presently the, the ground appeared to be alive with writhing forms of snakes, whose eyes glittered and forked tongues quivered as they moved in the direction of the princess's house. Foremost among them was a huge scaly creature that led the procession. The guards were so terrified that they all ran away, but the princess stood in the doorway as white as death, with her hands clasped tight before her, for fear she should scream or faint, and failed to do her part. As they came closer and saw her in the way, all the snakes raised their heads and swayed them to and fro, and looked at her with wicked beady eyes, while their breath seemed to poison the very air. Still the princess stood firm, and when the lead snake was within a few feet of her, she cried, O oh, queen of snakes, queen of snakes, give me back my husband. And then all the wrestling, writhing crowd of snakes seemed to whisper to one another, Her husband, her husband. But the queen of snakes moved on until her head was almost in the princess's face, and her little eyes seemed to flash fire. And still the princess stood in the doorway and never moved, but cried again, Queen of snakes, queen of snakes, give me back my husband. And then the queen of snakes replied, Tomorrow she, you shall have him. Tomorrow. And when she heard these words, the princess knew she had conquered, and she staggered from the door and sank upon her bed and fainted. As in a dream, she saw that the room was full of snakes, all jostling and squabbling over the bowls of milk until it was finished, and then they went away. In the morning, the princess woke early and took off the morning dress which she had worn for five whole years and put on beautiful clothing. She swept the house and cleaned it, adorned it with garlands and nosegays and sweet flowers, and prepared it as though she were making ready for her wedding. When night fell, she lit up the woods and garlands, gardens with lanterns and spread a table for a feast. In the house, she lit a thousand wax candles, and then she waited, not shown knowing what shape in, her, in which her husband would appear. At midnight, there came striving from the river the prince, smiling and laughing, but with tears in his eyes. And she ran to meet him and threw herself into his arms, crying and laughing too. 
And so the prince came home, and the next day the two went back to the palace, and the old king wept with joy to see them. And the bells, so long silent, were set a-ringing again, and all the cannons roared and the trumpets blared, and there was fresh feasting and rejoicing. And the old, old woman, who had been the prince's nurse, became the nurse to the prince's children. At least she was called so, for though she was far too old to do anything for them but love them, yet she still thought that she was useful and knew that she was happy. And happy again, indeed, were the prince and princess, who in due time became the king and the queen, and they lived and ruled long and prosperously. Well, that was my tale for today, which uh, had its own little cautions to it, among other things. Be careful what you wish for. Be careful what you ask for. Sometimes you'll get it, and that's not always a good thing. Thank you, and I'll see you again.